Today we're going to start with chapter 12. We've skipped chapter 11, going straight into chapter 12. We're looking at manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is the idea that Americans had the God-given right to take over the whole continent of America from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Um, this was the idea that dominated American thinking in the 1840s. The two main factors in Manifest Destiny were land and gold. These were the two things that people were looking for with the idea of Manifest Destiny in mind. They wanted to take as much land as they could. They wanted to find all the gold that they could. So this chapter has three different sections. The first one we're going to look at is across the wide Missouri. Expansion in the 1840s was not as sudden as it might have seemed at the time. The background of that dramatic decade lay in more than 20 years of dealings between the U.S. and Britain on the one hand and the U.S. and Mexico on the other. The basis of Manifest Destiny in the 1840s was the history of the territories of Oregon and Texas and the development of the Western Trails. So joint occupation. We're looking specifically right now at the Oregon Territory. In 1818, the US and Great Britain had agreed to jointly occupy the Oregon Territory together until they could decide how best to divide the area. So what was the Oregon Territory is actually present day states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, as well as parts of Wyoming and Montana. So this was a huge chunk of land there. It also included a portion of what is modern day Canada. At first, Britain did more towards developing the territory. Attracted by Oregon's abundance of beaver and other animals, British fur traders and trappers flocked to the region but theirs was a wandering profession and few of them settled down to build houses or to farm. In the 1840s, the number of white people living in Oregon aside from those involved in the fur, fur trade was only 200. So you think about this vast, huge territory that's taken in almost five states and a portion of another country. There was only 200 settlers at the time. These are people who built homes, farms, businesses, and were actually settled in one place. There was only 200 in this huge area. So that's not a whole lot. But then as the 1840s proceeded, more people began to come into the area. Part of that was due to missions, missionaries going into the Northeast. And these missionaries mainly focused on the Indians in the Oregon Territory. Some of the examples of those Indian, or excuse me, missionaries are Mar Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, and then Henry and Eliza Spalding, they went into Idaho. The Whitmans, though, were murdered by the Cayuse Indians. Let's see. The missionaries had opened the door for a flood of the immigrants. A thousand sailors came to Oregon in 1841. Within two years, the number had tripled and continued to grow. Now we're going to look at Texas. We looked at the um, Oregon Territory. Now we're going to look at Texas and the American settlement of Texas. In 1821, Stephen F. Austin led the first of many land-hungry American settlers into Texas. Soon after arriving, Austin received news that the Mexicans had overthrown the Spanish and gained their independence. He quickly secured approval for his venture by pledging allegiance to the new government of Mexico. These transplanted Americans prospered and others arrived to take advantage of the riches of the new land. Cotton growing and cattle raising in particular became major businesses in Texas. At first, Americans adopted a Mexican citizenship, but few adopted Mexican customs or viewed Mexico as their country. It became apparent that some Americans had moved to Texas with the goal of splitting the region from Mexico. In 
1830, Mexico closes border to additional American immigrants. It placed a heavy, also banned the import of slaves and placed a heavy tax on goods from the US. Many American settlers ignored the new laws. The number of settlers continued to increase and by 1835, Americas in the area numbered between 20 and 25,000, far more than the Mexican population. Many new settlers openly violated Mexican law by continuing to bring slaves with them. Stephen Austin and his followers advocated making Texas a separate state within the, Amer the Mexican Federation. So at the time, the idea was not so much to bring Texas into a part of the union, but to make it its own separate state still with the still falling under the Mexican government. Another group led by former Tennessee Governor Sam Houston was more radical and proposed a rebellion that would lead to full independence from Mexico. Houston's ideas was particularly popular with newcomers and with slave owners. So his idea was to give Texas full independence from Mexico, almost make themselves their own country, not a part of the US, but not a part of Mexico either, allow them to make their own decisions. Houston was the leader of the battle in which Texans were able to win, the, eventually win their independence. Looking a little at Davy Crockett, and you watched this movie Friday, I believe it was. It was either last Friday that you watched the movie or this coming up Friday or watching the movie. I can't remember. Over Davy Crockett. He died at the Alamo and is second in fame only to Daniel Moon among American frontiersmen. Born in Tennessee in 1786, Crockett was a farmer, hunter, and soldier. He fought in the Creek Campaign of 1813-14 and served in the Tennessee legislation and the U.S. House of Representatives as a Democrat. A shrewd self-promoter and frontier humorist, Crockett enhanced his reputation with outlandish tales of his achievements. For example, he explained with mock seriousness how he killed raccoons by grinning them to death. On one occasion, he said he was preparing to shoot a raccoon when it turned to him and said, is your name Crockett? When Crockett admitted that it was, the animal responded, then you needn't take no further trouble for I may as well come down without another word. Because he strongly disagreed with President Jackson over Indian removal and other issues, Crockett switched to the Whig party. Defeated for re-election to Congress in 1834, Crockett led a company of Tennessee riflemen to join the Texan War for Independence. He died at the Alamo. All right, so now remember the Alamo, what became a battle cry of the Mexican War. In 1834, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana discarded the Mexican Constitution of 1824 and declared himself as dictator. He became a military dictator, ruling by use of the military. The following year, the Texans prepared to fight, at first to defend the Mexican Constitution of 1824, which guaranteed them a degree of self-government within Mexico. Santa Ana approached Texas with some 5,000 troops and the Texans decided to change their demands to a call for outright independence for Mexico. Santa Ana planned to push through the heart of Texas, evacuate the leaders of the revolt, or excuse me, execute the leaders of the revolt and expel the American pioneers. His first stop in the effort was San Antonio, which was defended by a Catholic mission turned fortress called the Alamo. The commander of the Texan forces, Sam Houston, ordered the tiny force holding the Alamo to destroy the fort and fall back. But the commanders at the Alamo, Jim Bowie and William Travis, decided to hold the post and block the Mexican advance. In February 1836, Santa Ana marched into San Antonio and laid siege to the Alamo. The Mexican flew a blood red flag, meaning that no mercy would be shown to the defenders. Almost 190 defenders, including Bowie, Travis, and the legendary 
Tennessee frontiersman David Crockett held out for 13 days and they inflicted somewhere between 600 and 1500 casualties on the Mexicans. In the end though, the Mexicans stormed the fort and killed all the defenders. A few women, children, and slaves survived. While the Battle of the Alamo was occurring, delegates from throughout Texas had gathered more than 150 miles away. They declared independence from Mexico and began writing a constitution for the new country, the Republic of Texas. Sam Houston was named commander of the new nation's army. Despite the pleas of his men to attack the Mexicans and avenge the slaughter, Houston slowly fell back, forcing the Mexicans to stretch their supply lines. Santa Ana split his army into three forces to speed the crushing of the revolt. Seizing his opportunity, Houston attacked part of Santa Ana's divided army near San Juancito River on April 21st, 1836. In the brief but bloody battle of San Juancito, 800 enraged Texans, many shouting, remember the Alamo, easily defeated 1,200 Mexicans. The Texans captured Santa Ana and in himself and forced the dictator to sign a treaty recognizing Texas independence. So it's one important thing to draw out of this was Houston's battle strategy. Instead of just outright attacking them, he slowly drew back, lengthening the supply lines and forcing Santa Ana to split his army. This was a very strategic move militarily on his part. And you see it throughout history. The same things happen in the American Revolution um, where Corn Cornwallis was getting further and further away from his supply lines and it weakened his army. And the same thing was happening here. You're, they were getting further and further away from their main base of supply and end up having to split their army, making themselves weaker, making themselves easier, able to be defeated. So looking at the Republic of Texas, President Jackson refused to annex Texas because he realized that accepting Texas into the Union might spark a war with Mexico. He also knew that anti-slavery forces in the U.S. opposed Texan annexation because Texas would almost certainly enter as a slave state. So he recognized that they were independent, but did not support it becoming a new state. So there began a 10 year history of independence for the Republic or Texas or the Lone Star Republic. It's funny, my, um, I have a cousin that they lived for a time out in Arizona. And every time they would drive, him and his wife and his children would drive from Texas, drive from Arizona to here, they would drive through Texas. And he'd always talk about, talk about how long it would take to drive through Texas. And he made the comment one time and he was like, Texas should have been its own country. And I'm like, well, at one time it actually was. So nice little tidbit of history there. Texas was once its own country. All right, so looking at some of the trails going west, there was lots of dangers in traveling west. The roads were not the greatest. They were basically just kind of packed down parts of earth, but they weren't roads like what we think about, even like dirt roads like what we think about. They were just beat down paths. So some of the dangers that they encountered would have been Indian attacks, broken axles on the wagons, death of the oxen that pulled the wagons, bad weather, storms, cold, drought. And there was three main trails that went west. You had the Oregon Trail that led to Oregon. And some of these trails branched off to California. You had the Santa Fe Trail was a trade route between Mexico and the US. And then you had the Mormon Trail that was um, set by the Mormons when they fled to Salt Lake City. Non-Mormons used the trail to be able to continue on to Texas, excuse me, California. So this is a picture of the trails and you also had the California trail as well. You can see where it split off of the Oregon Trail. All right, in our next session, we're looking at two different presidents. You have John Tyler and James Polk.
So John Tyler became known as his accidency because of the way that he became president. He ran with, um, if you remember the campaign slogan, Tippica New and Tyler too, he ran with William Henry Harrison. And if you think about William Henry Harrison in the longest inaugural speech in history, caught a cold and later died six weeks into his presidency of pneumonia. So John Tyler became president and he did a lot to upset the people of his party. And they began to call him his accidency because they, he became president by accident. So the Whigs, which was Tyler's party led by Henry Clay, thought that Tyler would just submit to their guidance. Um, basically, they really didn't support him in his nomination as vice president anyway, but they were trying to win more votes by getting him to be their vice presidential candidate. So when he became president, they just assumed that Tyler would submit to them and whatever they told him to do, but that's not the way it happened. He had a mind of his own. So these, um, Tyler, he vetoed bills calling for higher tariffs, a new national bank and internal improvements, all things that the Whig stood for. He vetoed all of these things. So the Whig, Whigs responded by voting him out of his party, out of the Whig party. So he became known as the president without a party. His, most of his cabinet members resigned, all except his secretary of state, Daniel Webster. And the only reason he didn't design, resign at the time is because he was in the middle of negotiations with Britain over the American-Canadian border. And we'll talk about that in just a minute with the Webster Ashburton Treaty. But that's the only reason he didn't resign at the time. As soon as this treaty was signed, though, Webster resigned himself. So looking at the treaty, the northern border of Maine was a main point of controversy between Britain and America. So what Daniel Webster, as we talked about, was Secretary of State under John Tyler, and he worked to create this treaty with Britain to decide what, where that border is. So the U.S. received seven twelfths of the disputed area and then the British received the remainder. It also clarified the border between Minnesota and Canada. So if you look here at the treaty, at the um, treaty boundaries, the blue line here is what America thought that they should get. Because if this is all part here is United States owned by America. This part up here is Canada owned by British. So they thought they should get this part here. The purple is what was set by the Webster Ashburton Treaty. All right, so campaign of 1844 answered the question, who is James K. Polk? So Henry Clay in the election of 1844 was the Whig candidate over the discredited John Tyler. The leading Democrat was former President Martin Van Buren. The Democrats ended up choosing, choosing, excuse me, James K. Polk, which was considered to be a dark horse candidate, meaning a nominee who was not a serious candidate before the nominating convention and about whom little is usually known by the general public, meaning before the convention occurred that elected him as the Democrat candidate. Little was known about him. He wasn't on the radar. Most people weren't even expecting him to receive the nomination. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he becomes a Democratic candidate. Um, he was from Tennessee. During the campaign, we derisively asked, who is James K. Polk? They didn't know who he was. They didn't know anything about him. They had to find out stuff about him as they were going. Though not well known nationally, 
Polk was politically experienced. He has served for 14 years of the House of Representatives, including four years as Speaker of the House. He'd also been governor of Tennessee. His close association with Andrew Jackson earned him the nickname Young Hickory. More importantly for Democrat expansionists, Polk willingly ran on a platform that called for the reoccupation of Oregon and the re-annexations of Texas. One of his campaign slogans was all of Oregon and all of Texas. So he was able to win the election. Had Clay not lost the anti-slavery vote, he might have become president. John Tyler took the election results as a mandate to push for the annexation of Texas. So he saw that these people had nominated Polk and part of Polk's campaign was to annex Texas. So he saw this as the people wanting to annex Texas. So he took it as his last few acts in, in office to get Texas annexed. He proposed to annex the region through a joint resolution of Congress, an action that required only a simple majority in both houses. So with that, Texas became the 28th state in the union. And now looking at James K. Polk's administration, he was an, considered to be a disciplined executive. He had four goals, lower the tariff, restore the independent treasury system of Van Buren, settle the question of what to do with Oregon and acquire California from Mexico. So these were the four things that he wanted to do while in office. And he was able to achieve all four of those goals. With the Democratic majority in Congress, Polk easily attained the first two. The last two, which dealt with the fulfilling idea of manifest destiny proved to be more difficult for him. Furthermore, the final objective was soon a part of moral debate. Should the U.S. use a war with its neighbor, Mexico, as a means of expanding American territory? So we're going to look a little more closely at these last two ones, at looking at um, settling the Oregon question and then acquiring California from Mexico. Many expansionists clamored for the U.S. to take the Oregon territory, meaning they made a lot of rackets. They made a lot of racket. They called for the U.S. to take Oregon. So their slogans, slogans were 50, 40, 40, or fight, and all of Oregon or none. The British maintained that the boundaries should be the Columbia River, but the fur trade had declined, so they had less interest in the region. In 1846, the two nations signed a treaty that settled the Oregon question by making the 49th parallel the international boundary to the Pacific, the Britain retained all of Vancouver Island. So if you look at this map here, this is the Canadian border and this is where the line is, the 49th parallel. And if you look right through here, this is Vancouver Island, even though it became below the 49th parallel, they were still able to retain all of that island. All right. And then the last issue comes to a war with Mexico. Polk's fourth goal, acquiring California, involved diplomatic dealings with Mexico. Affairs with that nation, however, were neither so smooth nor so peacefully settled as they had been with Britain. In fact, the American desire for California, coupled with difficulties over Texas, plunged the U.S. into a war with its neighbor to the south. The Mexican War, which went from 1846 to 1848, was the climax and most violent phase of Manifest Destiny. Looking at the background of the war first with the causes, there was a history of hostility between the U.S. and Mexico. The U.S. wanted to gain access, wanted to gain property of California and New Mexico. They wanted the rich, fertile lands of California and its fine harbors. And others fondly recall the profitable trade that existed along the Santa Fe Trail. 
The annexation of Texas caused a lot of resentment with the Mexicans and they never recognized Texan independence. And then the fourth cause was a failure to reach a peaceful settlement. In 1845, Polk sent a representative to negotiate with Mexico. Polk was prepared to pay $5 million to settle the disputes about Texas and up to $30 million to purchase California and New Mexico. Mexicans considered that offer an insult to their national honor, and the Mexican government could not even discuss the idea for fear of starting another revolution among this angry population. And then a fifth cause, the real spark of the conflict was a dispute over the Texas-Mexico border. The Mexicans claimed that the southern border of Texas was the Nueces River. This had been the boundary between Texas and the remainder of the country when Mexico controlled the area. However, the Republic of Texas had claimed that the Rio Grande was the border, some 50 to 100 miles to the south. This was the border that President Polk supported. After Texas officially entered the Union, Polk sent a force under General, General Zachary Taylor into the disputed area between the two rivers. The, Mer the Mexicans demanded that they leave immediately and posted an army on the southern bank of the Rio Grande. On April 25th, 1846, Mexican troops attacked the detachment of American cavalry across the river. More than a dozen American soldiers were killed or wounded. Polk was already preparing to ask Congress to declare war on Mexico when news reached him on May 9th of this incident. Within days, Congress approved the president's request and war began. And war doesn't always just have problems on the battlefield and all. There's also problems at home as well. A sizable minority of Americans consider the conflict, an unjust war of conquest. Some opponents simply refer to it as Mr. Polk's war. They thought that the war was not justified, that they were only going to war to be able to gain territory, and it was all a part of Polk's campaign. U.S. military was not ready for a war. They had not had any significant conflicts and were not really prepared the credit for the American victory ultimately rested on the nation's naval superiority, the bravery of its troops in battles, and Mexico's lack of preparedness. Looking at some of the campaigns of the war, you had Taylor, remember General Zachary Taylor, his campaign in northern Mexico. He was the commander of the troops on the Rio Grande, was a veteran of the War of 1812 and several Indian wars. He was nicknamed Old Rough and Ready by his men because he dressed sloppily and lacked the distinguished image that many generals carefully cultivated. And then you had the New Mexico campaign. Campaign is almost too glorious a term for the capture of New Mexico. It was more desert march than anything else. Polk appointed General Stephen Kearney to lead a force of 1,500 men, mostly cavalry, down the Santa Fe Trail to capture New Mexico. Kearney's army left Fort Leavenworth in present-day Kansas on June the 5th and captured Santa Fe on August 18th after almost no resistance. Leaving most of his troops to occupy the newly acquired province, Kearney took part of his men west to aid in the conquest of California. And that gives us the California campaign. California proved more, much more difficult to capture than New Mexico. Captain John C. Fremont, an explorer known as the Pathfinder of the West, struck the next blow in California. Before the war broke out, Fremont had led a group of 60 men into California, supposedly to explore. But Fremont's party appeared too numerous and too well armed to be a simple exploration team. When the American settlers, they revolted against Mexico and established the bear, bear Flag Republic because their flag featured a bear. On June 14, 1846, Fremont supported them. By January 1846, California was firmly under US control. And then Scott's campaign in central Mexico. 
Tyler's victories in northern Mexico and the conquest of New Mexico and California meant little if Mexico would not make peace. Finally, Polk approved an attack on Mexico City in an attempt to end the war. The president assigned his task to General Winfield Scott, called Old Fuss and Feathers because of his love for military formality and discipline. Scott lacked the warmth of Taylor and was not as popular with the rank and file soldiers. But he had a better grasp of strategy and his Mexican campaign was one of the most brilliant in American military history. He planned to follow the route that the Spanish conquistador Cortez had followed more than 300 years before. They landed, his army landed south of the Mexican port of Veracruz early in March of 1847, and he captured the city in less than three weeks. Scott led the victorious Americans into Mexico City on September 14, 1847. And this was all that we just talked about. I just didn't forgot that I had slides over it all. All right, this is one that you will need to know for your test. John C. Fremont, known as the Pathfinder of the West, took California. And when the American settlers revolted against Mexico and established the Bear Flag Republic, Fremont supported them. So you can pause the video if you need to. Then the capture of New Mexico City was the last battle in the Mexican War. All right, so looking at the results of the war, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the war in 1848. Mexico recognized American claims to Texas southward to the Rio Grande and ceded New Mexico and California to the U.S. The U.S. paid Mexico 15 million and agreed to pay 3.25 million in debts that Mexico owed American citizens. In the Gadsden Purchase, the U.S. paid Mexico $10 million for territory bordering the southwestern U.S. The purchase finalized the continental U.S. at its current boundaries. All right, and that is the end. Y'all have any questions, feel free to contact me, and y'all have a great rest of your day.